Hi everyone, how's everyone doing today? I'm Eve Oxbury, I'm Editor of Professional Beauty and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, which is all about the F word. So we're gonna be talking about franchising today and this webinar is supported by Gino. So today's webinar will be presented by Ellie Tidy QFP, who is Gino's franchise manager, along with Justina Rostek, who is a franchisee and owner of the Gino Salon in Ellsfield, London. So hi, Ellie and Justina. Hi. <laughs> hi, thanks for joining. So um, before we get started, if you're interested in finding out more about franchising as we go along, we'll be dropping a couple of links into the comments box, um, both in Zoom and also in Facebook. So you can book a slot to meet with the team um, and some current franchisees at Professional Beauty London, and we'll be dropping an email address into the comments for you to do that. Plus, uh, Gina will also have a talk on our launchpad stage at the show, and we'll be dropping in a discount code in the comments that will give anyone watching 50% off a ticket to that talk. Um, and also, in fact, 50% off across all the talks on all our live stages at the show. So that's definitely worth having. Um, before I hand over to Ellie and Justina to get started, um, if you're watching the webinar live and you've got any questions as we go along, if you're with us in the webinar platform, just type your questions in the chat box here. If you're watching on Facebook, then type them into the comments and we will get to them um, to answer live at the end. But do type them in as we go along so that they're ready. Fabulous. So let's get going. Ellie, if you want to start sharing your screen. Fabulous. Thanks so much, Eve. So uh, as Eve mentioned, today we are talking the F word, all things franchising. Um, when I say franchising, I'm referring to um, your business joining a franchise network. So becoming a franchisee, not you converting your business to recruit franchisee, which would be franchisor, which would be a whole nother conversation. But for that reason, I am joined by, as you said, Eustina, who is our franchisee for Gino Ellsfield. Hi, Eustina, hello. <laughs> Thank you for having me. That's our absolute pleasure. So um, I feel really privileged to be here this morning uh, or this afternoon talking about franchising and business opportunities. Uh, bearing in mind, we've just kind of come off the uh, trial session and we're discussing it's actually two years since uh, lockdown. We first went into lockdown. Um, so to all those businesses that kind of survived through that pandemic, um, to be here talking to you uh, about franchising and moving your business to the next level, I feel really privileged. Um, so I'm really lucky. So thanks for being here with us. Um, so really when you start your own business, so you kind of have two options. You can either build from the bottom up from scratch. Alternatively, you can buy an existing business. Additionally, you can take that option with franchising as well. So you can franchise from concept or you can franchise uh, an existing business and convert a beauty salon into franchising. Um, what I always like to ask people or get people to do when they're considering franchising is a bit of a self-assessment. Actually, question yourself and what your goals are for your business. Um, think about your personal values and investment because um, becoming a franchisee isn't the right fit for everyone, but for some people it can be a really, really powerful way of doing business. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you want to elaborate more on that from your experience. You yes, yeah. I think the one of the main things, you know, because it is a commitment, you're committing to a major brand that has been successful for years. Um, so when I was first signing my franchise agreement and 10 years seemed like a long time, mm -hmm. you know, normally when, when people are opening the business, you might be, you know, doing a budget or forward planning for a year, maybe three years, depending on how you're securing your funding, because some banks might be requiring it, but you don't really plan for 10 years, yeah. it seemed a decade seemed like a long time. Mm -hmm. um, so it's definitely, like you say, it's, it's not for everyone, it's not for everybody, but I'm six years in. Six years, yeah. <laughs> and it's flying by and I'm loving it. I'm enjoying it. And I can't, I just feel like 10 years is not enough, mm -hmm. really. Yeah. Which is often, it, it's it's really understanding, as I said, that, that what's important to you? What is your objective with your business? Which I think sometimes, uh, particularly in our sector, mm. we just jump in because we love what we do and build. And we don't have that forward thinking of, considering our business as an asset to sell, considering an exit strategy, or even considering uh, what the future holds, you know, COVID, things like that, which of course you can't anticipate. Um, 
So let's dive right into the deep end and ask what is franchising? Well, franchising in its simplest form is a method of marketing goods or services. That's essentially what it is. Um, someone is granting the right or the privilege to a person or business entity to do something. That's the most simplest way of explaining it. That something could be selling hamburgers. That something could be providing eye tests. It could be doing haircuts. It could be running a hotel chain. The list is vast. Yeah, and I think it's what's happening as well is they are granting you the permission to adapt their model that they know is successful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's important to say, you know, because with franchise, they would have had businesses that are successful and they're letting you run your business along the same kind of plan. It's such a powerful way of doing business because of that, because a franchisor is essentially trialing and testing before. They know it's a proven concept and they know the model works. Within the UK, franchising is big business. Um, And within the franchise community, we kind of have two types of franchising or two veins that we would refer to. Um, Most people, when you say franchising, will either think of like uh, Harry Potter, Star Wars, Mm -hmm. you know, that's that's, um, trademark and product franchising or multimedia franchising. Or there is business format franchising. Um, business format franchising is what we as a brand are part of, as you know, um, and it's what I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about today. Um, your trademark and product franchising is essentially someone licensing someone to use their name. Um, for example, Disney is a really good like, example of that, where they don't manufacture their toys or their films, they license the brand. Coca-Cola, another one, very mm-hmm. similar. Business format franchising is kind of a more prescriptive version of that. Someone has tried and tested a methodology of doing business, whether that be providing beauty treatments or providing haircuts or whatever it may be. Um, And they are permitting a franchisee or a person or business entity to do that in a specific territory for a specific time. Um, They are obliged as a franchisor to provide training mentoring, coaching and ongoing support to ensure that there is a consistent high level of service. And what this does is builds an independent network of businesses all aligning with the same goals and values. And in turn, what that does is elevates the perception of the brand. Mm -hmm. Um, I think from a from a salon owner point of view, um, you know, like I said, you've hardly ever forward planned, not for 10 years. But with this, you're signing up for someone to give you an exact blueprint of to make your business successful for 10 years. Mm-hmm. You know, you're not going to be closing down. There's the rate of business, the beauty business is closing down. It's super high yeah. in our industry. You know, a lot of them don't survive past the first five years. Mm-hmm. Whereas with franchising, you're almost like given a foolproof model. And as mm-hmm. long as you follow it, your guaranteed success. It's interesting you should say that because um, there are two bodies uh, or trade bodies for franchising within the UK. Like we have uh, Babtap, Habia and HBF for beauty. Within franchising, we have the British Franchise Association and the Qualified Franchise Association. The British Franchise Association is just the more established. It's it's been around longer. Incidentally, as a brand, we are a member of the BFA. Um, And they actually conducted a survey and they said less than 7% of new startups for, uh, survive the first three years of business whereas uh, franchising it's nearly 90 percent survive so you can see the success rates mm-hmm. that you have in franchising obviously that's not specific to our sector that's franchising as a whole mm-hmm. um and the bfa part of that survey or study uh, conducted uh, they conduct it biannually with NatWest and that's where these statistics come for, from and you can see some of them on the screen now. Um, one of the ones I find really interesting is uh, top right there's over 48,000 franchise businesses in the UK so that is a huge amount of our high street the services we use which probably we were unaware were franchised um, And bringing that more relevant to our sector, I would say, if you look over to the left side of the screen, you will see uh, 37% of new franchises are women. 
So I'm really passionate about a sector that's really empowering women to go into business because what franchising do, does is provide a very clear and structured path, like Euston was saying, mm-hmm. to success or, or providing your business in the most efficient way. At the top of the screen, you can see kind of the Oxford English Dictionary definition of franchising, um, which is the BFA put together. And if your screen's small, I'm actually going to read this because it's quite a although it's a little bit very formal, it is essentially what it is. So it says franchising is a system of marketing goods and or services, and it's based on a collaboration between legally and financially separate independent businesses. So the businesses are still independently owned. They are just operating and trading under a brand name. Um, These are called the franchisor and franchisee. The franchisor grants uh, the rights or legal rights to a franchisee to trade in a specific way. Um, And as I said, what this does is creates a really powerful network of salons performing or franchisees, should I say, performing to a specific level or standard. Um, So for the end consumer, the customer experience of that product or service is exactly the same. And that's where it becomes quite powerful. And you can see on the bottom right, there's uh, 935 franchise systems within the UK. So probably most of your high street or services you use are actually franchised um, without you being aware, Mm -hmm. I would say. Most times when I talk about being in franchising, people go, oh, like McDonald's, you know, it's it's always what we associate. But as I mentioned, there's there's a it's a real vast amount. It's the pharmacies now on the high street. Even your Um, corner shop is very likely to be a franchise. One stop is franchised. Yeah. So this is actually some examples of franchise business. And I always find these quite interesting. So there's the common ones you said, like McDonald's. Uh, but Costa Coffee again, people probably know, but things like the body shop is franchised within our sector. We have Tony and Guy, Saks, Rush, Massage Company, Mui's, 810 or Spa 810. So there's a lot of mm-hmm. within the beauty sector providing this structured path to um, getting into business. Also, Francesco's. Uh, I think people always find IKEA surprising. That's one that yes. people, yeah, yeah, uh, uh, quite unaware of what I've given you are uh, predominantly retail franchises but you can see there is um, kind of service franchises things like Cumon Maths, Hilton, um, Action Co, so many so many services and I think when I came into the sector actually it really surprised me definitely Um, a great reference point is one of those trade bodies I mentioned British Franchise Association has so much information on franchises uh, that are available Um, When we uh, franchised um, in 2019, we built a programme called Gateway to Franchising, which is a performance growth and development programme. And we actually asked uh, some of the salon owners that joined the programme to tell us what they thought franchising was. Um, And on your screen, you can see some of those answers. So we've got being part of a brand ethos, giving a percentage of turnover to, uh, to the business, but getting massive support becoming part of a brand um but one that kind of resonates with me the most and I was discussing this with you Stina is I used to think it was someone running my business Mm -hmm. my thoughts have changed and I've got to say this is the perception probably a lot in the sector and it was my perception of what franchising was when Mm -hmm. I came into my role Um, but now I see it very differently what I can see franchising doing is providing people an exit strategy. You mark, you mentioned that 10 year plan yeah. within uh, our franchise model. It is 10 years. Um, but what it allows us to do is create milestones for a business owner to achieve something over a period of time. They have the right to sell at any time in those 10 years so they can get out quicker. But what we're doing is creating a path for them to perhaps step away and take a passive stream of income because the business doesn't need them to run mm-hmm. or they can sell the business as a much more valuable asset because the biggest focus for us as a franchisor is to create a very profitable business that can stand alone. It's not relying on that business owner to be in that treatment room doing the treatments, which is so, so much what we see in as business owners is how we started. We were so passionate that we loved what we did. And somewhere along the line, the business is so entrenched with Mm -hmm. what we do. Yeah. 
Additionally, it provides a kind of a step to growth, I think, a, a route to... It does. I think it's not someone running your business, it's someone helping you run your business. There's a nice. big yeah. difference. Yeah. Um, you know, there's someone giving you all the tools to run a successful business. Yeah. Yeah. So so it's it's like having someone who's done it before basically telling you how to how to make it successful. Mm. I like what you said about blueprint and we'll, we'll kind of come to that later for something called mm. the operations manual. Uh, most franchisors have a, a pilot as well where they test promotions, they test new products, they mm. try methodologies. Also what you'll find is uh, within a franchise network there'll be innovative people that have ideas that say oh, do you know what I'd really like something to work this way. What the franchise will, do, will, will generally do is say, right, let me take that, let us polish it, design it, make it work, and roll it out to everyone. Yeah. Um, the fillet of fish in McDonald's is a perfect example of that one. <laughs> um, uh, but within our model, we have toolkit items that have come from yourself, yes. other franchisees as, uh, um, yeah, as well. Yeah, it sounds because you're not on your own coming up with the ideas. You've got a network of people that someone will have a great idea and then yeah. someone will streamline it and make sure it applies to everyone else so yeah which is is what a franchisor would want to do they want to move the businesses forward um the reason it provides such a great clear path to growth is because it's sending a very strong message to your competitors to mm -hmm. your uh, clients and your team about the direction you want to take your business obviously in beauty with us we franchise and we're very focused on facials and that's the message we send again we with, with with other franchise models you are very clear about what your focus is and that's generally what franchising is yeah. It's also about the people to me. One of the most important things I learned in franchising is actually the franchisees, the therapists, the apprentices, the receptionists, the staff that work within the franchise. Those are the important things. And that's what franchising is to me, because what you've got is an alignment of values. Everyone is working towards the same goal at the end, which is a profitable business. It's a company ethos it's a company value everyone's working towards the same thing and what you create is a very very powerful network of kind of peers um and i think that that comes across as well you know if you're looking at franchises or if you look at those logos on the screen now you know and the fact that across any franchise network everyone is working to the same high standard mm -hmm. and is trying to build up that brand because at the end of the day it's their own business as well yeah. under that brand is imagine if you're moving into a new area I know I do it and I do it on holiday as well you know you move into a high street and firstly you know if I moved to a new area and wanted to go and get my hair done I'd probably look for one of those salons with those logos because I know the quality Mm -hmm. There might be independent businesses that, that might be as good, if not better, but I will have the trust in those because I know that they're working collectively to build that brand mm -hmm. and towards that brand yeah. ethos as and well. It's consumer behaviour, essentially, yeah. whilst, um, and that's where I think I, I really like franchising because it's a nationally known brand, but a locally owned business that's part of a community. Franchisors set up franchisees because of that reason. They could generally expand by opening company stores, but a company store will not have the knowledge of the community and have the mm -hmm. same um, connections within the community that a, 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 an independent business or a locally owned business does. So it kind of powers up. Mm -hmm. um, I was going to ask you, uh, you've, we've elaborated and kind of had a discussion, but is there anything else that franchising means to you as a franchisee, you know, from essentially coming into being a franchise and then actually being a franchise? Mm -hmm. What does it mean to you? Um, for me, it, it was the help. You mm -hmm. know, like I said, I think it's, it's helped someone running the business. It's making sure that if I'm opening a business and I'm making a huge investment and, you know, a lot of personal sacrifices as well when you're opening a business it's making yeah. sure that I will be successful and it's not just me wanting to be successful it's someone behind me that wants me to succeed as well mm -hmm. so that's for me what what it means I love that because it's it's one of the the things that I always kind of check myself with um 
we have to advise our franchisees on what is best for their business. When they join, I ask them what their exit strategy is. I want to know what they want to achieve by the end of mm -hmm. 10 years. And any time they come to me with an idea and I'm laughing because I think of Zoom calls I've had with franchisees and conversations about what they want to do, I will always check them against their end goal and say, right, will this deliver you? Will this enable you to achieve this? They can change the roadmap. Um, I just have to ensure the model delivers them that. Mm -hmm. But it's almost someone, you know, deep down that probably, I don't know, you taking the whole week off and your only therapist is not a good idea, but you ask us and we check you to, to your goals, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned support, and I think that's a really uh, nice way to link me on to the next slide, um, which is what, su what support does a franchisee receive? Now, what I'm going to detail here is a bit prescriptive about what what support we provide as a franchise or to our franchisees. However, generally you will find um, the backbone of support with a franchise or is similar, whatever sector they're in, because like we were saying earlier, um, if a franchisee succeeds, a franchise or succeeds. Mm -hmm. uh, if a franchisee fails, it's on the franchise or and the rest of the network as well. So it's in their interest to make that business a profitable business, um, which is generally the, the, the driving force. So the first thing uh, that is very uh, salient with any franchise is the business support. Um, a franchise or particularly with a premises based franchise um, will uh, look at the territory. They will look at the uh, socioeconomical demographics. They will look at the attractors. They will look at the footfall to ensure that the franchise could work in that area. So they are checking. Now there's always variables, but they want to ensure that the business has the best chance to work. Mm -hmm. That's the first checkpoint most franchises will do. Every franchise will provide you with this blueprint, which is the operations mm -hmm. manual. This is a confidential document that will outline everything. Mm -hmm. It's down to the setup of a trolley in a beauty salon. It's the way you greet your clients. It's template contracts. It's hiring letters rejection letters is everything in between you know if you look at something like um we were saying that famous burger restaurant it's how to create the burger in a standardized way everything is set up so franchisees can do what they do best which is deliver that high service um franchisors will generally give their franchisees preferential trading terms discounted rates because the most important thing is that profitable valuable asset and as a franchisor uh, you are a bigger brand you have the power to speak to other brands or other suppliers and negotiate better rates for your franchisees because you have the power of saying right I'm going to have a network of 50 100 however many that are going to only buy from you within our um, franchise model we permit our franchisees to buy outside but generally there's no reason because they're getting much better rates from you as a franchisee, though, I'm mm -hmm. listing off, you know, the top yeah. tier, what I'd say as a franchisor. <laughs> Talk to me about the business support, the planning, everything that goes I think in. The planning is the important thing. OK. <laughs> um, and I will always say that because in beauty, and I know so many salon owners, you know, they open a business because a premises become available down the road and they like the layout mm -hmm. or, you know, it won't require much decorating. I don't know. So, um they don't research the area enough. They don't research whether there'll be enough customers in the area. They mm -hmm. like it themselves. They open the business. It's like self-indulgence. They open it for themselves mm -hmm. to work in rather than for themselves to make a living and rather than for themselves to service an area or, or have clients, you mm -hmm. know? They just think, oh, I'm going to have a control of premises. So I think planning from a business point of view and looking at demographic is something that business owners often don't do. Mm. I also hear in beauty a lot of the time, someone having a business, they found the premises, they open it, they run it for years, they hire staff, but they don't really have clear objectives and clear branding. I've seen salon owners now that after 10 years of owning a business they're trying to write a blueprint mm. um you know whereas we start from the get-go with firm foundations almost nice yeah. you know because they're, they're still trying to find their feet and that's why you'll see salons that they don't know their identity they're chasing after new trends and new treatments mm rather than knowing from the start what they are what they are about have clear branding yeah yeah mm -hmm. so um I think that's really interesting because it's so um, with our sector, we're so passionate about what we do. 
we love our clients so much and we forget ourselves we forget that reward at the end and often we see like you said those 10 15 years have been a very you know successful business but actually then that opportunity of where to go you take yourself out the business is no longer there kind of thing so it, it's having that foundation I think and that's a really nice way of kind of explaining know, and it and sometimes we I think you know it's nice reward if you're working as a therapist it's rewarding when your client gives you a nice review and it's rewarding that they come back to you when you become a business owner and that transition from a therapist into a business owner a reward of your business is profit mm, yeah you're right and we have to be very clear about it you can't run a business to make your clients feel nice mm. them feeling nice it's something that happens in the process but actually the end goal mm -hmm. it should be about money yeah because otherwise you'd be employed yeah yeah <laughs> no, no, you're right um next is network now actually this one is on here because as a franchisor i actually underestimated this and this is something mm. from hearing the dynamics and particularly with covid in the lockdowns um the power of the network became so um, visible to me. And I think yes. if someone in the network can say it's so much better than me. So you no, I think firstly, the pandemic has changed salon owners' behaviours a lot. Uh -huh. Because mm -hmm. in the past, everyone was an enemy. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. There was very little of sharing advice, I feel. Mm. So um, online platforms have opened kind of a way for, for maybe salon owners to, to share. But it's very hard to share advice when you're running very different businesses. Mm. Whereas for us, um, sharing with other franchise owners, they run same business, they run same offers, they have similar levels of staff a lot of the time because we're similar um, size businesses. So it's really easy, you know, you can pro share proper advice that can be practically applied yeah. in the business. So the next two, I think, really kind of hold together uh, marketing and training um, are the foundation of any franchise or most franchises will charge uh, management service fees. And these can vary um, from us. I know ours is a very conservative two and a half percent. Franchisors can charge up to 15 percent um, for the marketing and training support that they provide. This is often done monthly on a specific amount of turnover ours is purely on the service turnover um how do you feel about the training and marketing that you receive as a franchisee um i think I, I said to you when we were discussing this earlier you know every salon will think well but i get my therapist trained anyway mm -hmm. the difference is that you will send your therapist to do the training they will absorb however much they could absorb in that intense day three days even a week they come back to the salon and that's it. And they mm. have to apply it. And it's very easy to pick up bad habits. Yeah. What we tend to do is that the training is ongoing and it's not on me mm -hmm. because I've got the support of a dedicated team and dedicated business manager who will come here and make sure that my team is mystery shop, that my team has audits, that they perform at the highest level. Mm -hmm. And if they perform at the highest level, what that translates into is not because, oh, they just have to do it to the protocol. What that translates into is clients returning and clients bringing their money to my business. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so, so the, on, the, the fact that the training is ongoing rather than one off, I think it's a, it's a great thing. And with marketing, um, marketing in salons and beauty salons, we're going into the summer, you will walk down every given high street and I guarantee you everyone will have pedicure offers in the mm -hmm. windows because everyone does kind of seasonal offers without planning and thinking about their marketing with a business head on. Rather than looking at where their business was at this time of year last year and maybe there was not many new clients coming into the business or maybe, you know, it needed a boost and maybe word of mouth clients or maybe they were doing too many body treatments and not enough face treatments. Why not build your marketing around the performance of your business mm -hmm. rather than what you think the high street might be doing? Mm -hmm. So that's what I love that you the franchisor looks at the stats and make sure, makes sure that the marketing helps to push my business forward, yeah. not just helps to please the high street. It's promoting the purpose. Essentially, yes. yeah. we, we, a franchisor will drive a specific KPI. They will do something to drive a behavior based on 
previous everything's based on data we make it look seasonal but there is a reason behind it yeah and that relates to the performance um in every sector you will find a franchise will outperform the independent version because you have the data you have the blueprint you have that um drive uh to make the businesses work and testing going on behind the scenes essentially Uh, to give you a snapshot of that I wanted to pick uh, something relevant to our sector uh, which is retail ratio and I wanted to use stats from professional beauty as well Um, and what we found or what professional beauty said is uh, independent salons retail ratio sits between five and eight percent I mentioned to you earlier that gateway to franchising program where we found our our salons adopted elements of the franchise model. They uh, came in, the average across the the candidates was 10%. When they graduated, the average was at 22. Our franchise network work at an average retail ratio of 30%. So you can see that performance is just elevated. Isolated, you may find certain salons outperform, but on average within the sector. Yeah, and I think you know what when you said, oh, you know, we salon franchise businesses outperform independents, and there will be independent salon owners that they're thinking, no, yeah, you know. and that's exactly what it's there but are some isolated. If you think about if you're an independent salon owner, think of your performance from day one. How many goes did it take you to get to that performance? For mm. us, we were achieving this from day one. Yeah, that's the difference. And what this translates to is an increase for us in turnover. So in France, uh, we see the average conversion uh, from a Guino stockist to a franchise. We see an increase of turnover of about 20 percent. So what this does, um, it kind of highlights to me some of the real pros and cons. And we're going to kind of finish the session Mm. and summarize with what we see some of the pros and cons of (laughs) franchising now. It's so funny when I actually sat and tried to think of these. Um, We've outlined some of the major kind of pros that we've discussed. The proven business system, you know, it's tried and tested. It's it's not someone investing their capital to try a beauty salon and make it work. We give a a specific methodology down to this is how you open your salon. This is how you close. This is how you market. Um, We discuss the, the training and marketing, the ongoing support. What we never touched on is the improved valuation, and that's due to the increased profitability um, and the fact that you're part of a brand and it's not uh, the goodwill isn't tied into a person, which so often in our sector, we find it is. Mm-hmm. It, it's it's tied in, you know, Ellie's beauty salon, it's tied into Ellie. So if you remove Ellie, the goodwill decreases. Mm-hmm. It's very movable and it kind of runs because it runs as the brand. Um, and that's where we see an improved valuation. Financing for franchising is generally easier to secure. There are specific segments within banks to fund franchising because a bank sees it as less risk because there are people that have tried the model and proven it works. Um, The brand and trademarks we discussed. um, Rights and territories, again, we kind of discussed that a franchise or will allot a specific territory that a franchisee can trade in. Sometimes that territory is restricted in most cases where they will permit not to license another franchise. So you have that specific rights. And of course, I discussed the supplier relationships. But what I wanted to talk about is the cons, because I think that's really why people are here. And again, um, these are the kind of cons that I hear a lot more. But I kind of want to turn to you, franchisee. What are the cons? What are the things that you kind of... <laughs> I told you, I'm, the, I'm probably the worst person <laughs> to go through them because every time, those are the cons that I hear from people, mm-hmm. but I'm a franchisee, I'm a convert. I, you know, for, for six years, I've been running a successful franchise. Um, but it's, it's interesting to kind of dive deeper into them and figure out why. And I think that's what people should be asking themselves mm. is why do you consider it a con? So... Uh, autonomy or restrictions of on operations like I said it's not that somebody else runs my business it's somebody else helping me to run my business so the autonomy I don't feel like Mm -hmm. it actually is a valid point almost because it isn't restrictions on operations that's uh people being scared that or what if I just have to trade within the limits of a franchise what we're seeing in beauty more and more these days is really salons choosing their niche and you know becoming just a waxing salon or just a nail salon or just a skincare clinic so 
with the franchise, that's basically that. But someone is telling you from the start what you should be and what your identity is. Mm. So it's not, rest- it, yeah. it's not restricting as such. It's actually helping you pick your niche. Mm-hmm. Mm, no, that's a really nice way of kind of explaining it because it's something that we do here consistently. Um, yeah. The, the the other two, the stability, again, uh, you've got to review the brand and understand the brand because, again, you are now perceived on the high street as that brand. So if your values don't align, mm-hmm. franchising might not be right for you. Mm-hmm. But if you choose and select and work with that brand or buy into that brand, like you only visit McDonald's, again, I'm using that as an example, your beauty salon owners, but uh, then that makes sense if you align with those values. But if you don't like it and that doesn't make sense for you to stand behind it. Yeah, just choose a brand that you like and use, I think, would be yeah. the thing, wasn't it? Because, mm-hmm. I mean, if you're, you know, if you're a vegan and organic beauty is your thing, then you'd probably be, you know, in your own salon, you'd probably be looking to have those brands. Yeah. If you're more maybe result driven or you want 50 years of experience behind you, then you would be looking at other brands. Mm-hmm. So it's just look at something that aligns with what you believe matters, I guess. And then the last sharing of operational data, um, the exclusive territory rights. Again, we, we discussed earlier, it's a pro and a con because whilst you can't open, again, you'll fix that territory. But sharing of operational data, this comes up a lot. Um, and we were chatting about this earlier and uh, you had some quite interesting <laughs> thoughts on this one. Yeah, I think if someone brings up sharing of operational data as a con, I think you have to take a real hard look at where your business is at the moment because Um, most of the time we don't want to give someone insight into our business specifically into the numbers and into the profit Mm. and loss sheet because they're not very good and when I say not very good it's because we're not making profit Mm. we're doing the business for pleasure and everything is on you know there's credit cards max out credit cards behind the business so I think if you're scared about running a business where you have to share operational data you really have to take a hard look at at where your business is and your reasons for that fear. Mm. Because with us, we're actually very happy. You know, I'm very happy. And I know when I first started the business, I'd be calling you or texting you. It's like, smash the budget again, you know, reach another target, reach another target, this much in profit, this much, this much growth every year. So when you're running a successful business, you will actually want to shout out Mm. from the rooftops about your data because it's good. And you vice know. versa, for us as a franchisor, we need to see, because if a KPI is under a benchmark, we need to help that franchisee hit that KPI. It's showing that there's a, an error in the performance. So we need to look at mm-hmm. training and support or marketing to, to kind of bring that up. Yeah. So um, I'm going to pass back to Eve. We do have some common Q&As, but of course, I can see there's things popping up in the chat. So I'm going to pass back to Eve so she can kind of uh, open the Q&As. Amazing. Thank you so much, Ellie and Eustace. That's really interesting. So yeah, we have had um, a question just pop through here in Zoom, um, which I'll I'll kick off with. Mm -hmm. And we've got a question from Adam, which is, um, we're an established skincare brand and have just opened our first salon slash spa. Do you have any- Congratulations. (laughs) Yeah, it's an amazing achievement. Um, Have you got any opinions on owning the brand that also supplies the products, wanting to reach out to franchise into more spas? And, and what hurdles there might be. So I suppose this is potentially a competitor, but... Well, no, this is, uh, like I said at the moment, this is a uh, slightly different vein. This is becoming a franchisor. Yeah. I would say um, I'm happy to have a chat offline with that because it's quite, it, it's a big section to talk about. There's a lot of considerations um, for stability, financially, um, what your objectives are. A good resource for anyone thinking that oh, is a British Franchise Association. They run free seminars and webinars on things, but um, Adam, my details are in there. I'm happy to have a chat with you. Obviously for us as a brand, we supply products. Um, we distributed for 40 years before, 30 something years before we started franchising. So there's a couple of things I can, you know, advice for me, uh, a competitor is a good thing because it shows the strength of franchising. It's always down to personal opinion, what brand, you know, there's Costa, Starbucks, Cafe Nero. So it's uh, the more the merrier for us. Excellent. I think it's a really interesting question because I think there are probably a lot of um, salons also out there that are looking to expand and it's considering whether they join an existing franchise, whether they franchise their current brand, whether mm-hmm. it's just different routes for expansion, isn't it? So certainly interesting one. 
Absolutely. And I mean, certainly everything that you, you were saying was really fascinating as well. I think it's certainly um, something that a lot of people haven't necessarily thought about is that exit plan issue as well. Mm. So interesting yeah. to hear about. Um, the owner is so commonly the absolute hub of a salon in our market, yeah. and, which is great for, for a lot of the time. But what happens when you want to retire or to move on, it's, it can be hard. So fantastic. Because our driver often for going into businesses, we're passionate about what we do. We love our clients. And we don't, we're seeing essentially what we're bringing in. We don't want to give it to someone else. We want to be our own boss. So that's, that's our drivers for doing it when actually there, there's, there's ways of doing that. And I, and I think for me, what I want to do is kind of spread the word that this is a credible way for you to, yeah. particularly if you're in an inexperienced business owner, but even for an experienced business owner, we have franchisees that have uh, a, an independent business and the franchise and what the franchise means is it's their way of growing without having to put all the hard graft in themselves essentially <laughs> because there's a ready-made blueprint business model that they can kind of stick to and more and more we're kind of hearing that as a route that this is kind of it's a pension because it, it's something we find a lot in our sector because the self-employed directors that there's no pension there it's it's the value of that business so it's almost creating that second passive stream or or a future pension or something to pass on to your kids. Um, that, that's mm. what we're seeing. Yeah. Um, yeah, which is really, yeah, an interesting consideration that I think a lot of people wouldn't necessarily associate with franchising. So great to hear a bit more about that. And also on the sharing operational data side, I think, um, as you say, people are sometimes nervous about that, but really there's there's so little data out there in the market, so little real data that having access to, to benchmarking and, yeah. and how, how your business... It, it's so important and it's really empowering. It surprises me and it also... It helps you question what you're doing because I think sometimes we we I'm coming you know I'm a therapist myself so sometimes we don't look at the bottom line of what we're doing we do it for the love rather than the actual and, and if you're happy with that being your decision and your driver that's cool but also what we will do is sit with you and go okay let's build business plan this let's see if your bottom line if this promotion actually is costing you money what's your objective what's your return on investment and there's someone questioning you those things and sometimes it's like yeah that's a really good idea let's do it most times it's like oh actually I've not considered <laughs> that element or but I think I think it's you know you always ask the questions as well because mm. I know you know when I wanted to change something in the business or bring another member of staff on board mm -hmm. you'd be like let's get on a call and let's figure out where the business is and what it mm. needs you know it's always someone helping you think with a business head on without getting too emotional about yeah. it. Yeah. I think that's what we often do in, in our business. We've got, as I mentioned, that end goal. So our, my interest is for helping this business to reach the end goal in my experience, how we're going to get it there or in, and my team and France yeah. and everyone that goes on. And, and it's, you know, it's like if you are driving, you're driving towards that destination rather than just driving around endlessly. Mm. Then you just run over the petrol <laughs> and you fold. <laughs> ah, that's a nice analogy. I like that one. <laughs> um, but it's, it's, again, we get commonly asked about um, you know our, our business can it survive with just Gino or you know they're, they're used to being multi-branded and things like that and actually um, we do permit our franchisees to do things outside of Gino but like you said I will question them why are you doing it what's the benefit again mm. using the example of McDonald's McDonald's have Coca-Cola in there so they but you don't think of Coca-Cola when you think of McDonald's you think of burgers so it's essentially we look at how it interacts with the brand and is it going to help your business be profitable yes. and achieve the end result those are the real yeah. main drivers it's not it's not getting a treatment and training your team in the salon for the sake of having the trendy treatment mm -hmm. isn't it mm -hmm. but also i think when you said about can the business survive with one brand what we don't often talk about is the salon I was in before I started my own yeah, franchise. True. <laughs> and it was the best secret, I think, in beauty because Gino had a flagship in mm -hmm. central London, a very successful flagship, hidden gem for kind of celebrities mm -hmm. and VIPs and the like. But it was Gino only. And actually, back in the day, we didn't do anything did else nothing, other than facials. No nails, nothing. No nails, no waxing. It was just facials. So I knew when I was taking this on that I can be successful under one brand. Mm -hmm. And it's because you're considered an expert, you yeah. know, people come here and they go, you're, you're experts in this. No one else will do this as good as you. It's like you said, the, the niche kind of thing. Yeah. But no, th thank you for having us. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. It's been really, really interesting. And yeah, great to hear kind of 
you know, the, what people are concerned about and how, you know, how franchising will work for certain people and not for others. And I think there's a lot of people that, that will have learned a lot. So thank you very much, Ellie and Yusuf. That's our thank pleasure. You. Thank you. And thank you everyone for joining us. And remember, if you want to find out any more, we've dropped in the comments and how you can get in touch with the Gino team to meet them at Professional Beauty London or to watch the franchising talk there. So do join us at the show. But for now, thanks everyone for joining us and we'll see you again soon. Thanks. Bye. Bye.